Welcome to more World of Warplanes content from this channel and in this video I'm going to explain for the benefit of newer players why the BF-109E at Tier 5 could be your first monster aircraft in the game. Before we do the customary parts of the video I suppose I'd better explain why I think the BF-109E could be your first monster aircraft in World of Warplanes in which case, why are we looking at the BF-109B? Well, very quickly, I just want to show you that the manoeuvrability figure on this aircraft is 65, and I've built it in the traditional manner of a high-energy fighter. That is, a fighter that depends on its speed, altitude performance, uh, to do its work. And it doesn't tend to engage in turn fights, except uh, against lumbering heavies, bombers, or grand attackers. So I have a polished skin here, and I have an uprated engine. When we come to the BF-109E, however, you have a choice. You can certainly build it that way, but that's not what I did. And as you can see, if you look at the maneuverability figure here, it's an eye-catching 90. Now admittedly, I've put on special equipment to extract the absolute maximum of performance I can out of this aircraft. So in three of the slots we have this highlighted equipment, which is special project equipment, a word about that in a moment, and in the fourth slot I have some experimental equipment. Now I don't know whether you'll be able to obtain special project equipment in the future. It came into the game for a short while. I haven't seen it uh, since experimental equipment which was came afterwards was introduced and I have a feeling that you may only be able to get experimental equipment from now on. You'll have to wait and see. Even so you'll see when we look at some of my other aircraft it's not the special equipment the special project equipment and the uprated equipment that significantly make the difference when you come to build this aircraft. It's the choice of equipment. Very briefly, with a maneuverability of 90 and an uprated engine in place, this aircraft can almost perform a dual role. It can be a high energy fighter, although not the best, but it can also engage in turn fighting with most, most things. It will certainly give unspecialized boomerangs a run for the money, Badly flown unspecialized Spitfires will present it no problem as well, and with the armament, it will strip them down very quickly if it gets the upper hand in an engagement. This makes it a, a formidable aircraft. Any aircraft that can perform in two, more than one role, or one method of flying, is a dangerous opponent. And that's what I think makes this aircraft, potentially, in the right hands, a monster. If we take a quick look at my other Tier 5 BF-109 E3, you'll see that I don't have any special equipment on it. It is all ultimate, and I've still managed to achieve a manoeuvrability of 80. This aircraft, however, won't be quite as um, effective as the BF-109 E, because it doesn't have the armament. Although, in one specific situation with this special pilot, Hans Weber, if you're in a dive, it will do extra damage. If we go up to Tier 6, we look at the Friedrich, and again, I've built it for maneuverability. You'll see that there is no special project or experimental equipment there, and it is still an eye-catching 89. However, the guns are beginning to become somewhat average at this tier, so this aircraft cannot be classified as a monster. There is a T7, tier 7 BF-109G, which I'm not showing here. Uh, it has mixed armament, and I think, frankly, I can best describe that aircraft as below average, tending towards mediocre, so not uh, for discussion here. Well, I hope that you can see quickly, with those kinds of figures, why the BF-109E is extremely versatile. So, let's analyse this map strategically and tactically. It's laid out in the five spots of a die shape, and in the centre we have a command centre, and there are two forward airstrips and two garrisons making up the five sectors of the map. Strategically, the command center is the most important, of course. Not only does it convey the standard three resources every five seconds, but it also calls in bomber flights to attack enemy sectors. The forward airstrips convey the same resources and are selectable as subborn points. Where they're situated means that's of limited value. And then the garrisons just convey the three resources every five seconds. Tactically, the command center is also important because it's the gateway to all other sectors. And in effect, the team that possesses the command center for the longest throughout the battle is likely to win it. Looking at the order of battle, 
We have myself in the BF109E specialised, a Bowfighter Heavy, a Spitfire 1, a Hurricane 2, a specialised BF109B and a P43. Quite a good mix of aircraft. The opposing team has an F4F, a BF109E which isn't specialised, a P38F, a Boomerang. They also have a bomber, the Dornier 17Z. Now it's low tier, but that could be a significant difference and a BF110B. No specialised uh, aircraft on the enemy team. However, this feels quite a balanced match uh, and some good matchmaking. So, having trailed in the strategy and tactics section that the command centre is all important, you won't be surprised that's where I'm going to go. Now, the BF109E is what I call a high energy fighter, which means it relies on speed altitude and also good guns. The difference between this and the Boom and Zoomer is that the BF109E in most cases is not going to kill aircraft in a single pass, whereas the Boom and Zoomer in most cases will kill an aircraft in a single pass and that probably means it's limited to heavies. By my de definition other players see it differently and they would certainly call this a Boom and Zoomer. Anyway, we're going to dive on uh, an air defence aircraft, do some quite serious damage, although I don't think I'm the one who kills it, and as I swing round I find I'm confronted by the BF109E on the opposition side, and you can see that I do a lot of damage with my guns to him. I gamble that I can outturn him, I swing back for him and I'm right, and he falls to my guns. And we've very nearly got the command centre already. As I swing round I have two aircraft that I put volleys into, although I don't actually kill them. And I can swing back so that I can have another pass at the LB show. It takes my pilot out, as rear gunners are wont to do. It doesn't really matter at this range. I set him on fire and he's nearly dead. On swinging back I find that he blows up. And that flips the uh, command centre to us. Now I'd quite like my pilot back. And it's important that this sector is retained by my team, so I'm not going anywhere for the moment. And that's when I spot that uh, the PF-38 has flown into the sector. I'm curious to see what kind of a player Old Duke is, so I decide to chase him. And I make a tactical error here. He's heavily damaged, he's flying out of the sector, he's not doing any work. I've no real re need to chase him, and it was sheer curiosity as to whether I could keep up with him that made me do it. And pretty much he keeps me at, uh, at the extreme range of my guns. But as you see, eventually I do manage to get to my guns to land and kill him. But that's taken me a long way out of the sector, and I can see a lot of red aircraft flooding into it. So I need to get back there quickly. The consequence of chasing uh, an enemy plane far out of a sector will become apparent in a moment. The enemy has gathered forces to attack the command centre. And the enemy are beginning to flip the command centre a lot more quickly than I expected, so I want to get this bomber down as quickly as possible, and now it's on a knife edge. I work the bomber over with the guns, but it's too late. And what was a full health command centre when I turned to come back to it has been flipped by the enemy, and that should alert you to the not chasing aircraft unnecessarily out of sectors. Now I've got to do the work all over again and retake the command centre. The I-16L doesn't see me coming, falls to my guns very quickly. Killing enemy ground attacks before they clear a sector when it's unlocked is a good thing. I very nearly fly into the other uh, ground attacker and then very nearly take out the BF-109B as well. That would have been a disaster. And that could have had a material effect on the game because if I'd crashed into the BF-109B in particular and taken us both out, who knows how long it would have taken us to get the command centre back. Would the enemy have massed here and made it impossible? I seize upon the BF-110B. I've got him at a disadvantage and he's an easy kill. And now we need just one more to get the, the, the command centre back. And I strip down the air defence aircraft quite quickly and we have it. And again, I begin to assess the situation tactically. We're three sectors to two up. We have the command centre. It's now important to stay here. The 
first enemy aircraft in is the LB Shuriken. So from above, take about a third of his health, probably a little less, maybe a quarter. Come round, put another volley in him. Strip him down a lot more quickly this time, but I don't want to crash into the back of him, even at the cost of losing the kill to another aircraft. As it happens, I don't. I get to finish him off. I see the bomber. And the great thing about this aircraft is its performance allows me to zoom up from the floor to certainly this bomber's height. And I work him over very quickly. He's being worked over by another aircraft as well, which is why he dies so quickly. I swing around to confront the next incoming aircraft, which is a multi roll will be an F4F. I'm quite happy to trade with him initially and then I avoid the ram. Swing round. I'm behind him and he's an easy kill. And for all of this defence, th the command centre is far from secure. So I need to keep defending. I'll find the P38F again. This looks like a similar situation to the previous one but this time we're starting at the edge of the sector and we're still over the middle even as uh, I'm firing at him now. This is a correct move. He's in the sector, I'm going to kill him in the sector. I'm confronted by the BF110B so I evade, swing round. I keep swinging and I keep swinging. And that was quite a good manoeuvre from the BF110B. I'm surprised he was able to evade me for as long as he did. However, now I'm behind him. He's an easy kill. And that's the winged legend that's gone through. I think the Akamatsu notification went through a bit earlier. We'll set about the AR2 again. I'm managing the guns a little bit here. Should be easy to finish on the next pass. Very kindly he shoots out my engine, I repair, chase him down. And he's probably out of the sector at this moment, but I can see there are other enemy aircraft that I need to attack, so I'm not going to waste time and let him turn to come back in. And the enemy again has caught the command centre, captured the command centre. And I'm a little bit surprised. F4F goes down with my assistance. I then shoot through the fog at uh, the ground attacker, probably the LB sure again, set him on fire, come around for another pass. And I was going to leave him until the se sector unlocked, and the Spitfire shot him down. Thank you very much. Not very aware of you. So the air defence aircraft have now spawned, they're nearest, nearest to me, so I start to size them up pick one out and begin to shoot him. I get him down. Good job. Grade 1 fighter. Hero of the Sky goes through. I look for another boomerang. He's manoeuvring. But you'll see I'm able to outmaneuver him. And I take that one out as well. Get on the tail of the final boomerang. In fact, it turns out to be a ground attacker that's flown, obli flown obligingly through the sector. That's very useful. And now one ground target and one enemy aircraft will be enough. But we have no more aircraft. They're all dead. And now I'm going to have to do something that I strongly recommend that you do not do except in this very specific circumstance. When you have no aircraft to take in a, a, a sector then you may take soft targets on the ground. But that's the only time with, with a fighter that I would ever recommend doing this. It's your lowest priority. And unfortunately, the Spitfire decided to crash in the sector and has made it a bit harder for us to take. I'll swing around to finish off the ground target. Then I'll go looking for another soft ground target. No point in shooting at armoured targets with fighters' guns. Now there's a bit of bug in the replay here. The targets are not showing up as unarmoured and armoured. It doesn't matter because I know which ones are and aren't anyway. 
Fortunately they have aircraft to shoot, but unfortunately the P-43 is then shot down by an air defence aircraft, and again, we haven't got this sector. The ACE notification goes through, I get rid of the boomerang, I turn around and I look for a, another air defence aircraft, one swings to engage me, I engage it, it veers away, and that allows me to get behind it. And with the death of this aircraft we should have the uh, command centre again. So I've had to capture this sector three times, and I did say at the start of the battle this seemed like a fairly good set matchmaking, even though we had the specialised aircraft, and I think I was proved right. The enemy BF-109E comes into sight, but before we can engage each other the battle is finished. And a good haul of medals, 20,040 personal points, and perhaps you're beginning to see that why, if you build it correctly, the BF-109E may be your first monster in the game of World of Warplanes. So let's review the outcome of this battle quickly, and as we can see, it was a 5 chevron battle, the best result, a grade 1 fighter, 81,898 credits, or silver if you prefer, with a premium count bonus. If we look at the message box, we can see there were no expenses, because the aircraft wasn't shot down and I used prepaid consumables. 5,085 XP again with a bonus, 254 free experience with bonus, six tokens. Uh, but only two of these were for the first medals of the day, that was for the McCampbell and the Marseille. There was also a mission lucky number that was created at the end of this, uh, completed at the end of this battle. And amongst these medals you can see the Marseille there, there was the Ace, Akamatsu, Winged Legend, the McCampbells, and a Hero of the Sky Badge. Coming to the personal score tab we can see that the class specific missions weren't quite completed, however enough was done to get the five chevrons. Personal points of 20,040, three sectors captured, 21 aerial targets destroyed, 5,415 damage to aerial targets, pretty handsome at tier 5, especially for a fighter, 32 critical hits with that armament, look at all those, and 810 capture points, and that was split, defending 200 and attacking 610. If we look at the team score, unsurprisingly that's enough for first position. Good contribution from the BF109B there. That's down tier, tier 4. Excellent work there. Spitfire and others participated if, to varying degrees of effectiveness on the enemy team. I'm afraid it was pretty much lambs to the slaughter on this occasion. And there you have it. An explanation of why the BF109E if you build it correctly, may become your first monster aircraft in World of Warplanes. I hope you enjoyed what you saw, and that you'll come back and see more of my content in the future. Until then, this is the Noble Q, aka Royal Flying Corps, signing out.